Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another table talk in my uh, continuing series on my uh, intermediate uh, park jet build uh, video series that I have uh, just started. So uh, I've uh, been having a bit of a conversation back and forth with one of my loyal YouTube followers. Uh, and he was asking specifically about the mods that I did uh, to this airplane, which is uh, what we're going to be um, building during the uh, intermediate uh, park jet build series. Uh, you'll find the first video where I just discuss it, uh, sort of the background, I'll have that uh, linked down below. Uh, so uh, I want to put in out a caveat that uh, I don't necessarily uh, modify planes just because I think that uh, you know the designer didn't know what they were doing or anything like that. Uh, I know there has been controversy about that in the past. Uh, essentially, I do it uh, for some, sometimes for form, you know, how the plane looks, maybe to put things a bit more scale. Uh, but primarily, for my experience, it's about uh, function. Uh, and the beautiful thing about scratch building uh, foam park jets, you know, the foam is not terribly expensive. So you can experiment to your heart's content. Uh, you know, the only real limiting factor, I guess, is your, uh, is your imagination. And, you know, if you try something and it doesn't work out, well, you can modify the plane again or just build a whole new one and it's you know it's not going to cost you uh, a whole lot of money uh, so that's you know kind of my thoughts about uh, modifying uh, park jets and you know I've, I've been flying park jets for over six years now so I, I sort of have a bit of a formula of, uh, of certain things that I find just work well for me and fit in really well with my uh, not only my flying style but my flying environment uh, you know, wind, uh, field conditions, that sort of stuff. So uh, that's, some of that is why I'm doing this. But anyway, I'm not telling you that you have to build your RC Powers SU-30 version 4 like I did. Uh, certainly, like I said, you feel free to build it whatever way you want. Uh, and maybe some of the things that I talk about in this video will also help you on uh, other builds, you know, give you some thoughts and ideas. So this is kind of the uh, why I do and how I do uh, the mods specifically to this airplane but a lot of them apply to uh, other airplanes. So um, I have a couple of sheets and notes here because as I was discussing it back and forth with uh, the gentleman I spoke about uh, I kept forgetting little things so hopefully I've captured everything here. I've also printed off a couple of uh, small parts of the plans to help make it a little bit easier uh, to explain. Um, so let's just uh, let's just get right into it. So uh, first thing that I did was I downsized this plane from original or from stock, which is uh, you know per the plans, let's say, uh, to uh, 84 uh, percent. The, the primary reason I wanted to do that was I built this one primarily for speed, and I had built another one previously uh, just before this one for speed, which unfortunately I lost because the prop came loose and I didn't do a good job of dead sticking. Uh, it in, and I've just found that this formula works out uh, really, really well. Uh, in the uh, comments down below, I just posted a uh, uh, blog post uh, on uh, some techniques that I've used to downsize or even resize uh, plans, park jet plans, using your home computer. Uh, so please go check out those uh, comments down below if you're interested in that. Um, okay, so I'm going to work sort of from the front of the plane to the back. So on the plans, I don't think I have uh, anything uh, on the plans here, but uh, I removed the canards and I reshaped the leading edge extension. On the, on the original plans, there's actually a canard sort of that comes out around this area here. Uh, I'm, personally, I'm not a fan of uh, park jets with canards. Uh, I, I just find that they introduce, uh, for me anyway, for how I like to fly, they introduce a bit too much uh, 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 bobble up and down sometimes in the in the nose, especially in the wind. Uh, so I removed those and I reshaped the uh, the uh, leading edge root extension and along the wing. Um, okay, I added about three eighths of an inch to the leading edge of the wing. Uh, so the the main reason I did that was to compensate for the lack, uh, losing some of the lift that the canards would provide me. Also, I wanted to uh, make sure the plane was, you know, he had an even little bit lighter uh, wing loading. So uh, I um, did that, put three eighths of an inch extra on the wing. Now I did that before I made my KFs because I made my own KFs. 
So, uh, you know, I wanted to obviously uh, fashion my calves based on my, my new wing area. So, all right, I designed my own uh, KF airfoils and I've, uh, I've got a template of them here. Essentially, um, my, my KFs are about uh, 40%, not, not, including this, uh, not including this piece that goes out along the leading edge root extension. My, my KFs are about 40% at the uh, at the wing root along the fuselage here and about 35 I think percent out at the uh, wing tip uh, I just found that to be kind of the magic combination again uh, for how I like my planes to fly so um, yeah so that's that's what I did I, I made that I made my own uh, chaos and you will be able to find uh, again link down below uh, I did a video on step-by-step uh, -step on how I make my KF-4 airfoils for my park jets. So I encourage you to, uh, to go down and check that out um, if you want to know how that works. Uh, I moved the leading edge of the prop slot forward so that it's only about a quarter of an inch deep. So I've drawn on this. These are the original plans. So you can, you can hopefully you can see here, this would have been the the stock leading edge of the prop slot. Okay, so I've moved it back so that it's only about a quarter of an inch deep. Like the motor, this is only one half of the wing plate. The way the plans are set up, you have to, uh, you have to trace out, uh, it only has sort of one half of the wing plate. Um, so this would be, this area here, the motor would mount, uh, the wooden mount would go right here. So uh, I shortened mine by about a quarter of an inch. So the reason that I did that is these plans are designed if you're using a, a 2212 or 2826, uh, you know, standard park jet size motor. Uh, because I'm using this uh, quad motor, it's half the height. The stator is only at uh, six millimeters high as opposed to 12 millimeters high. So that's the main reason that I did that. So you can see here, which I'm going to cover in a little bit more, you can see here there would have been a slot here where part of the uh, top of the fuselage here would have uh, fit in. So I had to make an adjustment there, and I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about that. I should also point out, when I, when I added 3 eighths of an inch onto the leading edge of the wing, it moved, as I flew the plane, it moved my CG forward by uh, uh, almost the same amount. So here's, here's the, uh, you know, the standard CG here. So what I ended up doing was, when I built the plane, I, I put my CG mark uh, at the sort of the top of this, this little button here for the CG, and that seemed to balance. But it will, if you do add on to the wing, it will affect where the CG ends up being. So, um, let me see here. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue to talk about the prop slot. Uh, what I also did, as you can see, my, my prop slot is essentially a great big uh, rectangle. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like, uh, you know, that big gaping hole in the middle of their park jet. I don't really mind so much from the standpoint of looks. I like to have lots of room for my prop uh, to breathe and, uh, you know, be more efficient, produce hopefully more, more power. So you can see this is sort of angled here. This would have been the original uh, prop slot. So all I did was I just sort of went straight across here at the bottom. And, uh, and made it bigger. Now you'll see that I've also made it wider over here. Uh, if I built this stock, here's the, uh, this, this portion right here is where uh, the uh, side of the um, bottom fuselage or the nacelles or the intakes or whatever you want to call them would be. So what I did here was I drew a line up from there and then I extended my, my, uh, my prop slot outwards. Otherwise, this part here would actually be overhanging. So I know it might be difficult for you to see, maybe I'll show you from the bottom. But you can see right here, like my wing plate is flush. If it wasn't, it would be sticking out about a half an inch. Now I did that uh, also because I downsized the plane and also I just, again, to open up the, uh, the prop slot. Uh, I should have mentioned when I downsized this, I probably, if you if you want to play with the size of it, I uh, don't really think if you're using, like I'm using a 2200 3S battery primarily when I fly this, 
Uh, if you made it any smaller, you'd have to you'd want to make sure that you had a smaller uh, power system or a power system that doesn't require as big a battery. Otherwise, you'd have a real uh, tough time getting your battery in there. You can see this. I mean, this has got a lot of flights on it, but you can see that I've you know I've sort of bent the foam out and. You know, there's a, there's a bit of a gap there now. It used to fit a lot more uh, tight, but, you know, just uh, 372 times putting batteries in and out of it for flights has caused it to, uh, to do that. Okay, so... Um, Alright, so I talked about the prop slot. Uh, I also added, um, you can see it probably easily from the top here, I added a spar uh, ahead of the prop slot and one uh, behind the prop slot. And I used, because I, I knew I was going to be flying this plane fast and uh, quite aggressively. Um, so you have the option, you can do that. I also used a 4mm carbon rod, uh, which is heavier than 3mm carbon tube. So, you know, you might have been able to get away with a 3mm carbon tube up here because it's locked under the KFs and maybe the four uh, millimeter carbon rod back here but that's that's just my uh, my choice and I've like I said I've flown this plane a lot and I've yet to see any problems whatsoever with uh, with wing flex so that's uh, worked out quite well so excuse me all right so in order to accommodate the shorter prop slot let me uh, find the right <laughs> sheet of paper here. So this on the plans would be, this piece right here would be this top piece of the fuselage and this is the bottom uh, here. So what I ended up having to do was I shortened that by about uh, 5 eighths of an inch so that you can see essentially the back of my fuselage now is just flush right with where the uh, back of the uh, trailing edge of the prop slot is there. So that's something that, uh, that you'll have to consider. Um, if you're not exactly sure, what I would probably do is cut the, cut the thing out full size and then dry fit it and then sort of see how much you might have to trim off of it. Obviously you also have to trim the, uh, the electronics bay door. Uh, so that was something that I had to do. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see this, this tab right here would fit into this longer slot here. So what I ended up having to do was when I trimmed it off, I just made like a little tiny sort of tab to fit into that slot there to make sure that it lines up. So those, that's something else that you'll, uh, that you'll have to consider. Um, Alright, I already talked about the rest of the prop slot. Uh, in order to make, uh, because I um, moved the, uh, changed the, where the prop slot was and also because I'm using a much shorter motor, on the bottom of these uh, nacelles here I shortened this up by about a half an inch, I just, or a, sorry, a full inch. So I used the same um, angle and I just trimmed it back by about an inch. So again, if you're just using a standard park jet motor, you don't need to worry about doing that, all that sort of stuff. But if you want to experiment with uh, one of these little beasties, these little powerful quad racing motors, that's, that's something that you'll have to do. And you'd have to do that on any, any sort of park jet with the... Uh, mid-mount prop and slot similar to this one. So again you could cut it out sort of full size see where your prop ends up and then and then trim uh, accordingly but I, I trimmed uh, I think a full inch off of the bottom of these uh, nacelles. Um, Alright I put all of my servos uh, close to the center of gravity. My, cent my CG is about right at the back of this uh, rudder servo here so I've got, if you, I, uh, hopefully you can see here, I've got my uh, aileron servo, my rudder servo poking down, and my um, uh, elevon servo there. So they're all bunched very close to the center of gravity, rather than being spread a little bit more uh, along the plane. So that's something that I did. Um, I modified the ailerons. Uh, I made mine about uh, 60%, and what I did, uh, hopefully I'll be able to hold this here. The, on the original plans, it has a full length, very large uh, aileron. So what I did was, I, uh, because I put my um, Elevon servos where I did, my linkage is actually running under here. So I didn't want to have this part of my aileron 
moving up and down and, and potentially interfering with my Elevon push rod. So this is about three quarters of an inch. I just uh, made this, I cut this, so this, actually, this part actually will glue onto the plane. This part won't move. And then what I did, I, I find personally um, about 60% of the length of the trailing edge of the wing works to, for me to be the, the best size uh, aileron. So what I did then was I just uh, measured this full length trailing edge and then I took 60% of that and measured again from the uh, where this three quarter inch line is out and then I, I just essentially used the the shape of the uh, stock uh, aileron but I don't have any moving out here or right here and the reason that I did that is again it's a, a personal thing I like the size uh, of the ailerons like this and I just find I don't actually prefer ailerons that go all the way to the wingtip uh, I personally, the way that I fly, I find that uh, they can cause uh, wing uh, uh, tip stalling uh, more easily. So that's that's why I uh, I went that way. So all right, moving along here. Let me get to my, my second page of of notes here. Um, all right, I modified uh, my rudders. As you can see, my rudders are are. Uh, fairly small compared to stock. Let me get the right sheet here. Okay, so here you can see uh, the rudder uh, is quite a bit further forward. The hinge line is quite a bit further forward and then it ang actually angles down at an angle. Uh, so mine, uh, let me just do a quick measurement for you. Again, this is an 85 or 84 percent. So my, uh, my rudders are about an inch and a quarter uh, deep. And then what I did, as you can see here, was I just went uh, straight down and went straight across. So the bottom, the bottom of my rudder is, uh, is actually parallel to the wing plate. Uh, I prefer um, rudder hinge lines that are perpendicular to the wing plate, not angled. Uh, the reason being, I don't do a whole lot of high alpha flying, but when I do, I have found that the angled hinge line for me uh, can can induce uh, rudder roll more easily. Or if I you know if I go up say and I'm doing a you know I'm doing a stall turn let's say and uh, you know I slow right down and then I kick the rudders hard over. I, I want essentially want the plane to do kind of one of these. And sometimes what happens if with those hinged uh, or angled, what I found is that the plane will also uh, have roll induced, which I which I don't want. So that's why I use the uh, the perpendicular um, rudder hinge line, and I cut along straight along the bottom, uh, and I, I downsize them. I have, this plane has plenty of rudder authority. Uh, you know, even the <clears throat> times that I do decide I want to play with a little bit of high alpha, it's got plenty of rudder authority uh, that way. So uh, no problem whatsoever. So that's why I modified uh, my rudders that way track of what I've talked about here. Okay, I downsized the uh, Elevons uh, considerably and also, uh, you know, drew them to look like, uh, more like an SU-30 with these sort of uh, boom style things here in the, uh, in the middle. Um, now, one thing that I do, uh, I should, I, I can only get one of my papers here. When I'm going to modify a plane and I want it to look uh, a bit more scale and I want things to uh, match up. I print off this is just from Wikipedia and it's you know your standard sort of three three D uh, you know top view, side view, front view uh, of the plane and what I do is it's, it's actually quite small so I just right click on it save image as in, into my computer and then I print this uh, uh, as, a, if, if, as if it was a picture and I just print it off full, so you know it's cut off a little bit here, but I'm not too worried about that part. So what I do here is knowing that I use the the uh, wingspan of my plane as the constant variable in the equation. So if I want my elevon span tip to tip of my my elevon here to be uh, scale in relation to my wing tip, what I do is I measure like on this diagram. I will measure on this diagram, and I find using metric, millimeters, centimeters, is a lot easier to do this uh, than inches. 
Um, so I'll measure the, the span of my elevons, I'll measure my wingspan, and then that I divide the uh, elevon span by the wingspan, and that gives me a, a, a ratio or a percentage, which on this plane actually turns out to be 0.66, so it's about two-thirds. And then what I do is I, I know if my wingspan is 25 and a half inches, let's say, I multiply 25 and a half inches times that, times that 0.66, and then I should uh, come with a number to, to allow me to downsize my elevons. If I had built this with the stock elevons, uh, they would have been about even an inch wider. They would, I think, close to 18. I think I wrote the number down here. I apologize here. Yeah, they would have been 18 and three quarter inches from the tip to the tip, and mine are about 16 and a half. And again, I built this, uh, you know, I wanted it to look a little bit more scale, and I also, I built this for speed, so I wanted to be able to reduce, uh, you know, the, the, the large uh, span on my elevons to hopefully reduce the drag. So that's something that I do, and you can do that probably, you know, if you wanted to calculate even the, you know, the height of the vertical stabilizer. Uh, like I said, I always use the wingspan as the constant because I know what the wingspan is going to be on my plane. Work out a ratio, multiply my wingspan by whatever that percentage is, and then I can know whether my, you know, my vertical stabilizers, my elevons, whatever else are in, uh, you know, in, in close uh, scale. Um, another thing that I did is I made uh, the front part of the elevon, um, I made it one piece, so it's actually a fixed uh, uh, horizontal stabilizer here, you can see. Um, so I did that for uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, I like, it had, in my experience, it actually provides some stability, uh, and also, again, now I don't have this moving surface that's going to interfere with my uh, Elevon uh, push rod here, and then I just have a, you know, a completely straight uh, hinge line for my two uh, Elevon surfaces. So that's uh, another thing that I did. Uh, RC Powers actually introduced this in the uh, MiG-29 version 4 and I think the SU-34 version 4 and it's another one of RC Powers many uh, brilliant uh, contributions to the uh, park jet uh, community including uh, obviously this plane. Now if you wanted to build this if you were downsizing it and you still wanted it to be the the hovering park jet, which is what it was uh, uh, sold as or, or touted as when it originally came out, then you might not want to downsize those. For the way that I like to fly, these smaller uh, elevons, tons and tons of, uh, of pitch authority, and because I uh, couple them with ailerons, I've got tons of roll authority. So, uh, you know, I, downsizing them that much uh, has certainly not interfered with how the plane uh, flies. Um, I trimmed. You can see here on this, there would be a, a fin extension on the back here. Uh, this, is, this is actually on the bottom of the plane. The wing plate would be right about here. So I trim that off. Uh, you can see here I've trimmed it off so that it's sort of just ahead of my, uh, my Elevon hinge line. Uh, I didn't feel that I needed that out there. Again, if you're uh, wanting to fly this... Uh, as a hovering park jet, or you want to fly it a lot, you know, doing a lot of high alpha or that things like that, I would uh, maybe leave those on. Uh, quite honestly, I'm certainly not a high alpha expert. Um, I, I, it's not something that I practice a lot. I do every once in a while, but this is even just the way that I have this plane. I found it is one of the easiest planes to do uh, high alpha with. I don't even bother with flaps or flapperons or spoilerons or anything else. Uh, and I can get this plane to do pretty reasonably scale high alpha. I don't, I'm not really interested in hovering it. Uh, you know, when I, when I see an actual real SU-30 hover, uh, then maybe I'll be uh, interested in that. But uh, yeah, it's the way it is, it actually flies uh, really well slowly and high alpha. Um, okay. I have experimented with um, uh, trimming uh, anywhere between five millimeters to a whole centimeter off of this bottom ventral fin. Uh, still, uh, right now, this on this plane, I trimmed five millimeters, and I still have plenty of, uh, of stability in the roll and the yaw, so uh, no, no problems there whatsoever.
All right. Well, I think I've covered all of the um, the uh, mods. Uh, I've talked a lot about them in a previous video where I did a table talk on this plane, but they they were sort of uh, also mixed in. Excuse me here. They were also mixed in a lot of with uh, building technique discussion about foam and things like that. So that's why I wanted to go over this, and I I think I may have actually missed a couple of them. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I think I've caught everything in, uh, in detail if you're, uh, if you're still with me here. All right, so like I said before, please, uh, please check out the comments uh, down below for links to the blog post, uh, some other videos um, that, I can, that I can think of that I will uh, link down there. Uh, I also wanted to mention at this point, um, I have, cause I, because I have been asked this question as well, in my plane, uh, when I build it as part of the build series, I, I am still going to build my uh, Elevons vertical stabilizers and my nacelles uh, out of Depron. I, I'm, pardon me, I've still hoarded a few sheets of uh, hobby grade Depron, so uh, I will be doing that out of Depron. But what I am going to do is I'm going to cut uh, a piece, uh, an Elevon and this out of Dollar Tree foam. Uh, as part of the build series and I'll show you if I was going to build it entirely out of Dollar Tree foam what I would do uh, with respect to where I would leave the paper on, where I would leave the paper off uh, and how I might uh, reinforce it uh, especially down here on the uh, on the nacelles and the intakes uh, because I like I said I have been asked about that so I will I will do that. Uh, I have built one Park jet entirely out of Dollar Tree foam, and I have learned quite a few lessons from that. Uh, so I, I will also link that video uh, down below if you're interested uh, in that. Okay, folks, I think that is it. I think I've covered uh, everything. Uh, again, if I if you think I've missed something or if you have any other questions, uh, please uh, post a comment down below. Leave a comment on the blog, or again. Um, I will have my email address, uh, scott.parkjet at gmail.com, will be uh, down below if you feel more comfortable uh, emailing me. Uh, I don't have any problems with that either. So uh, thanks very much for watching. Blue skies, calm winds to everyone. Parkjet noise, you're the sound of freedom, baby. Take care.